Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? It's so good to see you. So good to have you. Um, my name is Yana. I'll be kind of hosting you tonight, so to speak. Um, and if you haven't been having a fantastic Christmas yet, it's about to get good here right now. <laughs> In fact, I thought it would be extra special to bring some of the people who saw the very first Christmas. And, but to set the mood, we got to sing some of those Christmas songs, right? Um, so if you join me in carols, that'd be amazing. We're going to start with the first Noel. The first Noel, the angels did. To certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night. Champion Center. What, what I did find though, is I got close. I found a shepherd in the Shepherd's Assistance Program, or SAP. So she was at the first Christmas. She was just she was just not fully fledged, but don't tell her I said that. <laughs> so without further ado, Shep. Yo, I'm Shep. <laughs> I graduated. Shepherd's Apprentice Program at Bethlehem Community College, top in my class. Of course, being top in the class in the Shepherd's Apprentice Program isn't all that big of a deal. Shepherds aren't known for bringing the brightest bulbs in the pack. But I have a special connection with teeth. I don't know if it's my uh, naturally curly hair, or if I just like hanging out with things that are dumber than I am. <laughs> I don't have much status yet, since I'm just an apprentice. I don't even really have a staff yet, but I have a shovel handle, and I work the night shift, and it looks pretty authentic after dark. <laughs> I also made myself my own Shepherd Apprentice Program jacket. <laughs> I call it my letterman's jacket, because I put letters on it. <laughs> but we kind of hang out in the night program. Um, not much to do when the sheep are sleeping. Sit around and watch sheep sleep. <laughs> Try and say that three times fast. Sheep sleep, sheep sleep, sheep sleep. Oh, so you can be saps right along with me. <laughs> but the other night, we were there, sitting around the fire, watching the sheep sleep, and telling sheep jokes. I'm really good at sheep jokes. I know lots of them. What do you get when you dip a sheep in chocolate? Candy bar. Oh. <laughs> anyway, we were sitting around the fire, staying warm, telling sheep jokes, and all of a sudden, Shazam! There was this little guy, dude, hanging right there. I got my shovel handle just to protect the sheep, and he said, Don't be afraid. Sit upright. Dude, you are floating and glowing. <laughs> said, I've got good news for you. Yeah, what's the good news? A baby's born. So, what 
this just isn't any ordinary baby. This is God's son. You mean the Messiah that we heard about in church? That's the one. Awesome! I was so excited. I said, where are we going to find him? He said, well, you know Bethlehem? <laughs> Bethlehem. I was born in Bethlehem. I grew up in Bethlehem. I graduated from Bethlehem Community College in South program Problem Pops. <laughs> I know Bethlehem. Well, he's going to be in a barn, in a manger, wrapped up in his loving clothes. And I'm thinking, something's not lining up here. <laughs> this isn't making a whole lot of sense. What's he doing in a barn? In a barn, in a cow's dish, thinking something's fishy. I think, well, why are you telling me? He said, I don't know. God said, tell the shepherds. Well, I was thinking about that. The whole sky, it was full of dude and dudettes, and they were singing a glory song. I've been to concerts before. I've heard on the adrenaline, Toby Mac. <laughs> I'm laughing compared to this glory choir. The music, they say, resonated with my bones. And I wanted to be floating and glowing right up there with them. And then, all of a sudden, as fast as they had come, they were gone. And I thought, did I really see that? Did I eat something weird for dinner? Then I looked at the other sacks, and their mouths were hanging open, and they were kind of quivering just like I was, and I thought, it's for real. I really saw it. Let's go find this baby. And then we made the first year sap stay with the sheep. <laughs> and we took off running. I made all the shortcuts into Bethlehem. So we took our staffs, we hopped over the fences into Elijah's yard, down through Jake's, and, and right there we were in the close to the middle of Bethlehem. Boy, was it full of people. All over, every place you looked, there were extra people. They were there for the census, and the barns stuffed full of tired, sweaty animals. And we peek at each one as we walked down the streets and the alleys. Then, up in the little town, we saw him. Just like those glowing dudes had told us, right in the barn, laying in the cow's dish. And I thought, this isn't right. This, this isn't okay. This is the Messiah, God's son. What is he doing in a barn? And indignation just welled up in me. I thought, I wanted to snatch him right out of there. I wanted to wrap him in a warm blanket. I wanted to take him home to my bed or something. But not here, not in a barn, not in a barn that smelled like this one. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, does God really know what they're doing? God, do you know where they put your son? But then I thought, oh, he does know. Because those glowing dudes told us where to find him. And then I looked at his mom. Oh, she had such love in her eyes for that baby. And that guy standing right next to him, so protective like, I thought, oh, it's going to be all right. And I came in, and I knelt down right next to him. I was one of the very first people to see the Messiah. Me, a sap. I thought, oh. I watched his chest go up and down as he was breathing, and I could have touched him. But I didn't. Somehow, I was afraid I might get him dirty, and I didn't want to do that. And I thought, the glowing guy told me, a sap. I, I'm one of the first people to know. God told me, this baby isn't just for the rich people. He's for saps. Then I felt kind of bad. I'd said, man, 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 it did the first year's <laughs> 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 
But my old insides just thought, this baby's for me. He came for me. And suddenly, I wanted to tell everybody. I jumped up and I thought, I need to go. I need to tell people. And he went racing out and I said, he's here. The Messiah is here. I've seen him. And there were glowing dunes out in the sky. And some of the people backed up and thought, stay away from him. <laughs> In other words, they wanted to know, where is he? Where can we find him? And I told them where he was. And suddenly, you know, I didn't feel like just a sap anymore. I felt like a mouthpiece of the Messiah. Mouthpiece of the Messiah. That kind of has a ring to it. It could be a van or something. Does anybody make bumper stickers? Mouthpiece. Instead of a sap, I could be a mom, mouthpiece of the Messiah. Gosh, what an incredible story. I want to tell everyone all about that, too. Um, I happen to know some songs about that night, and I just kind of feel like singing now after that, don't you? supposed to. But, 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 you know, because, well, they, they had a good reason, they had a good excuse. They were at PLU giving some lectures for the students, because, you know, they're real smart guys. But, they did, because they're friends of mine, they did tell me that they could give me one of their bodyguards to talk. Yeah? And, because he was there the night of Jesus' birth, too. So, I wanted to welcome to the stage Bruno Bocelli. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, goodness. Surprise me. I'm, I'm not supposed to be surprisable as a bodyguard, but you did. Oh, well, glad to be here. I know. I know. I look uh, a little long in the tooth to be a bodyguard, but, but there is something to be said for experience, and uh, I do go to the Y almost every day, and so that I can uh, keep myself ship shape. <laughs> yeah, and then the, the range, I keep that up too. Yeah, but I gotta admit, I am feeling a bit naked because uh, it seems that my Middle Eastern gun carrying permit is <laughs> not any good here. <laughs> so I had to leave my gun. So, but you probably don't care that much about me. You want to hear my story? So I'll tell you it's my story. I'll, uh, I'll start from the beginning. Probably a good place to start. 
Tell me, agent. My agent calls me up and he says, uh, he says, I got this, I got this uh, opportunity for you. He says, uh, these three wise guys are going on a, a journey, and they need some protection. Yeah, check it out. So I, I, I met with these three fellas, and uh, they seem like nice enough fellas. A little, uh, a little over academic. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, I said to him, I said to him, so you're, you're, you're going on a journey. Yeah, we are. So where are you going? Well, they said we're not sure. What? We're not sure where we're going. You're not sure where you're going. All right. Uh, so why are you going where you're not sure you're going? Well, we're going to see the king. Oh, king. Okay. I've seen a king a long time. That does sound like fun. So, um, what's this king the king of? He's the king of Jews. Oh, oh so we're going to Israel. Okay, that's, that's quite a long way from where we are. But uh, I, I got the time if you got the money, which they did. So we shook on it and I went back and, and got my stuff. And, and that night we set off. I'm surprised. Why are we traveling at night? One of the wise guys says, pointing up to the sky, he says, you see that star? I says, I did, that's just quite a star. He says, we're following that star. Excuse me? We're following that star. You're following the star. Uh -huh. uh, why? Well, God told us. Oh, I've probably known this guy a day, and already he's pulling out the God card. <laughs> Well, it didn't look like the religious fanatics I'm used to, so I figured I'd just let it slide, okay? So, uh, but it's a long way from where we are to where we got to be, and uh, we're going to do a lot of walking and some camel riding. And I'm a bit averse to camels. That's a different story. <laughs> but I'll tell you that one sometime. And uh, so, so anyway, we're walking along, and it gives us a lot of time to talk. A lot of time to talk. So, we're talking, and they started telling me about all the stories about this king we're going to go see, written about in this old book that they've got. This old book. I said, really? Yeah. All these sto hundreds of stories written about this guy we're going to go find. Yeah? So that um, when we find him, we'll recognize him. Really? Yeah. They're called prophecies. That's pretty interesting. It's true. You know. Well, we'll see. So on we go, finally get close to Israel, and they say, uh, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Oh, okay. Did you say that in the book? No. Nope. Oh, why are we going to Jerusalem? Well, we just figured we'd probably have to go to Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm just here for protection, so uh, we're going to Jerusalem. Get close to Jerusalem, and they say, oh, we're going to go see King Herod. Oh, wait a minute. King Herod? Yeah. Do you know King Herod? No. King Herod is this sort of wicked, brutal kind of... Are you sure you want to go see Herod? Yeah, we've got to go see King Herod. I said, uh, is he going to want to see you? Are you that important? That doesn't matter. We've got to go see, see King Herod anyway. <sighs> okay, well, I'm not much of a praying fellow, but <laughs> I started praying. Yeah, I started praying, God, uh, uh, what, whatever happens, don't let these wise guys uh, make this King Herod angry. You know, because I'm not sure what he'll do if he gets angry because he thinks he's the king of Jews. And so, I mean, I started praying uh, pretty darn regular. So we, we, get, we, get to, uh, we get to Jerusalem and the palace, and uh, there's all these guards. Now, you know, I'm pretty good, but I'm just one guy. I'm trying to take care of these three wise guys, and I'm praying some more. We get in the palace, more guards past the kitchen, more guards. Finally, we get we get ushered into into the throne room of uh, Herod, the current king of the Jews. I want to closely to see what's going to happen here. And they start telling him about this new king that, that they're searching for. Then he says the strangest thing Herod does. He says, "Well." After you find him, come back and tell me so that I can come and worship him too. 
I was thinking, come on here, he doesn't worship anything or anybody. And I'm watching his eyes. Now they weren't watching his eyes, but I'm a bodyguard. I watch people's eyes. And when he said with his mouth, so I can worship him, his eyes said, so I can take him out. <laughs> but he's not bothering the wise guys, so I'm not sort of like that's fine too. And, uh, and, and and off we go at night. <laughs> Following a star, and this star takes us to Bethlehem, and, uh, and then that most amazing thing started happening. Uh, it's, it's almost like the star started moving or something, you know, because it's taking us down this street and then down this street and takes us right to this house. It's like it stops right over this house. I'm thinking, wow, I'll get no free time like this, you know, and I'm thinking. I bet you one of these guys can go up and knock on the door and we're going to freak out some really nice people. But, and that's what he does. Yeah, he walks up and knocks on the door. You know, door opens. There's this nice young lady with this little lad. And uh, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I thought we were looking for the king. Are we a little early? But, wise guy turns around and grabs this big bag of gold. Holds it out to the lady and says, here, man for your son. And this wise guy comes up. He's got a box. Really expensive movement. He says, here man, this is for your son. And the third one comes up and says, you, you guessed it. It's got some vial of really expensive perfume. He says, man, it's for your son. You know? And to top all that off, all three of them fall down on their knees. And they start worshiping this little little lad. I'm thinking, wow. And before I know it, I'm on mine too. You know? Wow. Have you ever had something happen in your life so incredible, so wonderful, so amazing that you never got a lick of sleep that night? That was that night. Wow. So the next morning, <clears throat> we have breakfast. And uh, one of the wise guys says, he says, you know, I had a dream last night. Yeah. Uh, we're not supposed to go back uh, back to Jerusalem and back home the same way we came. Uh, Herod's up to something. Oh, oh, oh I said, I, I agree with that one. You know, I saw his eyes. I saw the look in his eyes. Yeah, he's some whack, that kind of thing. No, yeah, I'm in this for the long haul. Let's go a different way. That's what we did. And along the way, they talked to some more, talked some more about all the things written about him in this book, about how he would grow up, you know, the kind of man he'd be. The life that he'd live, what he'd do, the people he'd touch, that he'd be the savior of the world, that he'd die, and then come back to life again. Wow. Unbelievable. I really like these wise guys. <laughs> I like them so much I became a permanent bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, but just between you and me, <laughs> I serve a different godfather now. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to my story. I hope you have one for me. What a powerful and unforgettable testimony and experience. Gosh, I happen to have some songs about those guys, too. <laughs>
So for our final guest, I really wanted to get to as close as Jesus as possible. I really wanted to do Mary or Joseph, right? Their pa his parents. But you know that singing Christmas tree at Life Center? They snatched them up months ago. Um, instead, I was able to get a hold of Joseph's accountant. His name is Charles Fussbudget III. <laughs> He's quite the character. But he's the accountant for Joseph and Sons Fine Furniture. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, hello there. I understand you're getting ready to celebrate the birthday of a friend of mine in a couple of weeks. I was asked to share a few things about him from my perspective. First of all, let me tell you that I'm a numbers kind of guy. I believe that one and one are always two, and that two and two are always four. Four and four are eight. Eight and eight are... 16, 16 and 16? 16. How about 32 and 32? 64. Sounds like you folks are a lot like me. We believe that when we add up facts, the sum total is always true. By the way, let me introduce myself. My name is Charles, Charles Fussbudget. I am the CPA for Joseph and Sons Fine Furniture. But my story goes back before Joseph, Joseph ever appeared on the scene. Joseph's father, Jacob, and I were classmates. We went to school together. We were more than that, we were best friends. After graduation, Jacob went into the construction business, and I went into, what else? Accounting. Eventually, Jacob needed someone to keep his books for him, so he called my accounting firm. I was CEO. I was CFO. I was COO. I was OCD. <laughs> you guessed it, I was a one-man show. Well, I was there at Jacob's house when Joseph was born. He had a set of lungs on him that just wouldn't quit. I watched him grow up into his preteen years, and that's when he'd come down to the construction office after school. He'd take scraps of wood, piece them together, and he'd make things. He came into my office one day with something that had four legs and a top. I think it was supposed to be a table. Anyway, he said, Uncle Chuck, what do you think of this? Well, I surely couldn't discourage the boy, so I said, Joseph, it looks to me like someday you're going to have your own furniture shop. Oh, I put a smile on his face, and he ran to the back, and he started honing his craft until he grew up, and he was turning out the funniest furniture in all of Nazareth. Now, Joseph was the one who always had goals. One was to start his own business. Another was to start his family. So with the business goal decided, he pursued the family goal. <laughs> I'll never forget the day that he walked into the shop one and he had a bigger smile on his face than normal. He had a spring in his step like I'd never seen before. He said hello to everybody as he went back to his workbench, sat down, and he started giggling under his breath. Oh, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I walked over to him, put my hand on his shoulder, and said as seriously as I could, Joseph, what's wrong? He looked up at me and he said, Uncle Chuck, I did it. I popped the question. She said, yes, I'm going to marry Mary. Oh, did we get our money's worth out of that? He was going to marry Mary. And so it all began. We started doubling up everything we said. From Joseph, Joseph's going to marry Mary to, where's Chisel? Chisel? I don't know. Has anybody seen the hammer and that hammer? Nobody saw the saw. And the best one of all was at lunchtime when someone said, pass the honey, honey. <laughs> oh, we laughed. We carried on. We had so much fun. We started planning his bachelor party. We, we talked about remodeling his house. Those were some great days. And, and then it all changed. He came in late that day. Joseph was never late. His head was down, his shoulder socks. He didn't say a word to anybody. He went back to the bench and sat down. Again, I walked up to him, put my hand on his shoulder, and asked him what was wrong. He looked up at me with, with tears just streaming down his cheeks. He said, Uncle Chuck, Mary's pregnant. And it's not my baby. He went on to explain that he did to embarrass Mary by taking her out into the public and announcing her infidelity. Instead, he wanted to send her down to a cousin of his that lived in Java. Well, we talked about it. We decided that we'd send my nephew there in a couple days to see if that was even possible. So the next day when Joseph came in, he looked different one more time. This time his eyes were glazed and he sat there and, and, and just stared. 
as I approached him, he didn't even let me ask the question. He said he was going to marry Mary. He said an angel appeared to him in the middle of the night and told him that not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. He said that an angel, the angel had said that Mary had been overshadowed by the Spirit of God and that she was actually carrying the Son of God. Now, if that's hard for you to believe, just stop thinking how hard it was for me, the facts add up to truth, God. Just didn't add up. But then I heard Mary's story. And I saw the peace that both Joseph and Mary displayed during this whole situation. And, and eventually, well, eventually it sounded like maybe it could be true. Well, the pregnancy went well, and Mary and Joseph were able to live above all the scandalous talk in town. About the time that she was to deliver, Caesar sent out a decree that said everyone had to return to his ancestral home for some kind of a new census. So Mary and Joseph joined themselves to a small caravan that was heading to Bethlehem. This would provide them with some safety and some comfort during the trip. <laughs> Not that a nine-month pregnant woman can be comfortable on, the, on a five-day, 80-mile journey on the back of a donkey, but it did give them some peace of mind. Well, they finally arrived at Bethlehem, only to find out that everyone else had gotten there first. There were simply no rooms available. The only place that offered them any kind of shelter at all was a barn, which they shared with some cows and some goats and some sheep. Well, you already know that Mary gave birth there to a son. No midwife, no family members there to help her out during this time, just Mary and Joseph, the animals, and a baby boy. Now, according to Joseph, a few hours after the baby was born, there was a quiet knock on the door. Who knocks on barn door? <laughs> it was shepherds. Really, shepherds knocking on a door where animals sleep? Well, they soon explained their politeness. They said they didn't want to wake the baby. How in the world did they know there was a baby in the barn? Well, they just had this amazing experience. An angel appeared to them while they were on the hillside, and he told them that a, she that a Savior had been... No, no, no. He told them the Savior, Christ the Lord, the Messiah, had been born in Bethlehem, and they could find him in a barn, lying in a manger. And at that time, the whole sky lit up as an angelic choir began singing praises and glorifying God. Uh, they just had to go see this for themselves. It was about eight days later, it was eight days later, when the baby was being circumcised, that his name was finally revealed. They called him Jesus. <laughs> Not Joseph II. Not little Joe. Not even Jacob after his grandfather, but Jesus. Do you have any idea what the name Jesus means? It means the Lord saves. <laughs> you know what my name means? Charles. It means man. You just want to look at me and you can pretty much tell him a man. That's not hard for me to live up to. But, but the Lord saves? It's got to be hard to live up to. But unless you really were born of God. Uh, unless you really were born to a virgin who was overshadowed by the Spirit of God, and unless you really are the Son of God. Well, I watched him grow up just like I did Joseph, and like his stepdad. He'd come down to the furniture shop after school. Whenever the bell above the door would ring announcing a customer who walked in, Jesus would jump up and yell, Hey, Pop, I got this! And he'd run through the curtain and he'd slide up to the counter and say, Welcome to Joseph and Son's Fine Furniture. My name is Jesus. How may I be of service to you today? Oh, how he loved people. And he so wanted to serve them. When he turned 33, or turned 30, he decided to stop molding and fashioning wood and to start molding and fashioning people. He chose 12 men to travel with him daily throughout Galilee and Judea and Samaria as he taught people everywhere he went about his father, his real father. Oh, God. His teachings were so simple and yet so profound that they brought frustration and confusion to the religious people but life and hope to those who really heard. He performed miracles. I saw the blind see and the, the lame walk. I even saw the dead raised to life. 
Now, I, I wasn't there when our friend Lazarus was raised from the dead, but I did see him a couple weeks later. He looked so healthy. I couldn't believe that he had been dead four days. He didn't look anything like what people around here refer to as as uh, zombies. <laughs> well, after three years of ministry, he told us that we were going to go to Jerusalem for Passover like normal. But this time he said he had to go. And then a few days later, he said he was going to die in Jerusalem. But we all thought that he meant when he was old, you know. I don't think any of us realized that his death was just a few days away. By the time I heard that Jesus had been arrested, he was already leading a procession of people up to Mount Calvary, carrying the cross to which he had been condemned. I hardly recognized his bleeding body. I watched as the soldiers nailed him to the cross. And then I watched as they raised the cross and suspended him between heaven and earth. And I watched him die. I watched as they removed his body from the cross and put it inside the tomb. And I watched as the huge stone was rolled in front and sealed with him inside. I wept uncontrollably. I thought I had it all figured out. I, I added up everything. Mary and Joseph's incredible stories. The Holy Spirit. His birth, all the prophecies that He fulfilled. His life, His teaching, the miracles. His name. But for the first time in my life, all the facts didn't add up to what I had perceived to be true. And then, three days later, I hear a rumor that Jesus is alive. Again, the facts. I saw Him hanging on the cross. I, I saw a soldier take a spear and thrust it deep into His side. I saw His lifeless body placed inside that tomb. The truth was, Jesus had died. But, but I now know that there is a higher truth that prevails. Jesus once said, in fact, it was at the tomb of Lazarus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that, my friends, is a truth that you can take to the bank. It's about, two week, about a week later, I, I saw him. Not with the broken and battered body, but in a renewed, glorified body. And I realized that it does add up. You see, when you look into the face of someone that you've held as a child, you watch him grow up into manhood, you watch him serve people by meeting their needs and forever changing their lives. You watch him die. And then you see him alive again. And, and he looks at you and he gives you this all-knowing wink that everything's going to be okay. You're changed. At least I was. So, going back to my original statement, when you add up facts, the sum total is always the truth. In the case of Jesus of Nazareth, when you add up all the facts about Him, I think the total can be summed up best by using His own words. Jesus said, and I quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, thanks for listening to my story. Merry Christmas, God bless you, and... Happy birthday, Jesus. Thank you, Charles, for sharing your story. What an incredible privilege to have been beside Jesus his whole life and to have witnessed his death and resurrection. It really puts a whole new meaning to the words, Behold, I am making all things new. God designed us to be connected to Him and to have a relationship with Him. And our wrongs broke that connection. And we can't fix it. Only Jesus can do that. Um, maybe you've never done that before, or maybe it's been a while since you remembered that decision. If so, um, I invite you to take this moment to say to Him, Jesus, 
please take away my wrong and clean me from the inside out. I want a relationship with you and please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Um, amen. If you do that, uh, gosh, this is going to be the best Christmas ever for us now, right? Um, remembering all that Jesus has done for us. I have a Two more special songs, I think we all know, um, to really worship him and celebrate that. Repeat the sound in joy, repeat the sound. 
you throw those guys one more time? Yeah. 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 Guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, again, sometimes holidays can be um, super exciting and wonderful and all the great things, and oftentimes they can bring about uh, hurtful thoughts from people in the past and people that were here that aren't here, all of that. I mean, holidays can just bring up a gamut of emotions. I just want to challenge you to not lose sight of what Christmas is really about. It's about Jesus, right? So, so let's not lose sight of, of Him being focused on who we are, right? Can we all stand together tonight? Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, make sure you give somebody a hug before you leave. God bless you. Be encouraged today.